this is not working right. Okay. All right. So um, thanks for having me. Thanks to the, to the conference organizers putting together such an interesting program. Glad to be talking about some of the work we've done over the past year uh, working in R and related uh, softwares for developing reproducible coding pipelines for particular analyses of COVID vaccine trials. So my name is David Benkesser. I'm at Emory University uh, in Atlanta. Um, you can follow along with these slides if you like through this shortened uh, link here and the source codes available on my GitHub as well. So I'll just start with an acknowledgement. This work is really far from being only my own. We had a really great team that came together spanning a great partnership between uh, academia, industry, and the government uh, that was really able to make this happen. So we'll take you back. The year is 2020, and the government has just announced uh, what will be long regarded as the, the best named program in governmental operations history, uh, Operation Warp Speed, which was uh, aimed at accelerating the development of a COVID-19 preventive vaccine. And there were a lot of ways that, that basically the government tried to do that. The primary way is they basically went to industry partners and said, uh, we'll give you guys a whole lot of money to take away the risk for funding these trials. Uh, and in return, we'll ask for a little bit of uh, oversight of those trials and to be able to provide our own input into um, studying questions that we think are important, important for, for stemming the pandemic. And so part of that sort of government involvement in this effort was the founding of uh, the COVID-19 Prevention Network. So this is a, a clinical trials network that was formed by NIAID, that's an arm of the National Institutes of Health, uh, to establish a clinical trials framework for evaluating candidate uh, COVID-19 vaccines and monoclonal antibody prevention therapies. Uh, and the way that NIAID went about doing this and the way that I ended up getting involved in this is they went to existing clinical trials networks that have you know, been long invested in by NIH and had a, a great amount of expertise here uh, in the U.S. Uh, for vaccine development. So these were expertise spanning clinical sites, labs, uh, recruitment specialists, people who are really on the, on the ground recruiting individuals for these trials, as well as statisticians. And uh, so that's sort of where I got roped in. I've worked for a long time with the HIV Vaccine Trials Network, uh, which is based um, all over the U.S., but, but primarily during my time at the Fred Hutch in, in Seattle uh, and extending to my time here at Emory, I'd worked with this vaccine trials network, and that was one that got rolled up into this uh, COVID-19 prevention network. And, and in particular, our statistical team got brought on uh, to serve several roles. So some were sort of related to simple sort of consultative roles with uh, the companies, uh, you know, advising on behalf of the government on the design and analytic strategies for the trials, advising on sequential efficacy monitoring, safety monitoring, responding to DSMB comments, so forth, the sort of vanilla, you know, standard uh, set of, of things that statisticians work on in clinical trials. But one of the big elements that, that we were brought on to do was handle the harmonization of a plan for immune correlates analysis of these vaccines. So I'll describe a little bit about what I mean by immune correlates. So immune correlates is really trying to understand how these vaccines work. So we have the clinical trials that are set up to really give us a good idea of whether or not these vaccines are providing uh, preventive e efficacy, right? Whether they're preventing COVID, severe COVID, all those bad outcomes, right? But we wanna go a little bit beyond that and try to leverage the data generated by those clinical trials to learn a bit, little bit more. In particular, we're interested in understanding the immune pathways whereby these vaccines are actually uh, providing protection. So why is that so important? Well, number one, it's interesting biologically, of course, if we understand the immune mechanisms uh, that prevent COVID, we understand potentially how to, how to better prevent COVID in the future, how to prioritize future vaccine developments and so forth. Uh, but really one of the key goals and why the government was so interested in funding this line of research and insisting that the companies integrate this into their research development plans uh, was the potential to identify surrogate endpoints. And surrogate endpoints here meaning, you know, when these, uh, when these vaccines were initially evaluated, as we probably all remember, this involved a huge a huge lift, right? These were 30,000 individuals enrolled in these trials, at least 40,000 in some cases. They're going to be followed up for two years. Uh, and these are at, you know, hundreds of study sites across the country. They're very expensive, very time consuming. And in the context of a pandemic, even now when we have availability of effective vaccines, right, we're, it's not available enough to meet market demand. And so there's still even now uh, a pressing need to basically speed along the clinical development process for COVID vaccines. And if you're able to uh, uh, identify uh, an immune response that's essentially predictive of whether or not the vaccine works, well, that speeds up the entire development process. You no longer have to do a 30,000 person uh, 
efficacy trial where we wait along, you know, six months, eight months, a year to figure out whether the vaccine is preventing COVID. Instead, we just give, say, a couple hundred people the vaccine. We check that the vaccine induces the right amount of the right immune response, right? And then we declare that that vaccine is efficacious, right? And this is how, indeed, how some vaccines are already approved, like the seasonal flu vaccines uh, go through a regulatory approval process in, in a very similar way here. So this is really an important goal and something that, that Operation Warp Speed Leadership was really interested in making sure that we were set up to, to evaluate about these vaccines that were being funded by the U.S. government. Um, and, you know, with the goal of not only approving new vaccines, of course, that's interesting, uh, but as well as expanding the indication of existing vaccines. And we've sort of already seen that, that, that this is what the FDA is doing as they move the age limit of these vaccines uh, to be lower and lower. They're making that decision not based on efficacy studies, though there are small efficacy studies. The decision is primarily being based on, uh, on antibody responses that are induced by these vaccines. And so we've already sort of seen this in action. So, so that's, that was the goal. And so our statistical team was brought on to, uh, to, to assist with this, to assist in the, in the design of these trials, making sure we're, we're generating the right immune response data in the correct way that we can reliably generate inference about these uh, so-called correlates of risk and correlates of protection. And so I'll just give you a flavor. This talk isn't really about the science of that, though if anyone wants to follow up about the science, you know, I'm more than happy to talk at length about that if we're interested in. But I want to give you guys a flavor of the types of analyses that we do for these to sort of motivate why this was a challenge for us and, and our statistical team. So all of this starts with <clears throat> actually fairly simple sort of descriptive characterizations of immune responses. So basically in these studies, everybody gets a vaccine and after their second dose of the vaccine, Right. They, they come back and we take a blood draw and we measure certain immune responses. And for the COVID vaccines, those immune responses are basically antibody responses. So there's different different ways of measuring how, how good your antibodies are. It's binding, there's neutralizing, there's different binding and neutralizing assays. So there's sort of a lot uh, of, of different ways of measuring antibody response. But for our purposes, it's good enough to just think that we're in some way measuring how good your antibody response to the vaccine is. And so when we get the data from these trials, that, that includes, you know, the, the data from, from the phase three trials and immune responses induced by the vaccine, the first task for us to do is sort of just describe the immunogenicity of those vaccines, right? So we want to characterize the distributions of those immune responses. We want to study simple correlations between those, you know, pretty boring kind of basic descriptive statistics, and yet things that are very important for us to figure out how to do the more exciting downstream analyses uh, in, a, in an appropriate way. Uh, so after we've sort of done the, 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 the simple descriptive statistics about these immune response distributions, we're then interested in correlating those immune responses with risk. So you can think of correlates of risk as really sort of a risk prediction. Like you can imagine sort of the outcome of a regression model being whether or not somebody gets COVID or the time until they get COVID, right? And the predictors that we're interested in in those models are these immune responses, are these different antibody levels, right? And so these can be sort of very familiar statistical methods, things like a Cox model, things like logistic regression. Uh, and we can make plots like we see here on the left where we're basically modeling the probability of COVID as a function of, you know, say a neutralizing antibody response. So this is showing if this was indeed a correlative risk, we'd see that the higher your antibodies go, the lower your risk of COVID goes. And we say then that this, this is a correlative risk, right? The level of antibody response is correlated with your risk of COVID. And so this is potentially a useful surrogate marker for COVID vaccines. Uh, we, we go a bit beyond sort of the simple regression uh, frameworks for evaluating correlates of risk as well. And we do sort of machine learning exercises as well. So on the right here, this isn't from COVID, this is from an HIV vaccine study, but we can kind of set up a, a, a supervised prediction game here or supervised learning game where we define different sets of immune responses, you know, binding antibodies alone, neutralizing antibodies alone, binding plus neutralizing antibodies. We, we define these different feature sets and basically see how well we're able to predict somebody's risk of COVID based on those feature sets. And then by comparing across those different sets of features, we can answer questions like, you know, is one antibody marker good enough? Should we be considering multiple antibody markers, right? What's the sort of marginal benefit of measuring uh, more antibodies in these studies? Um, and so that's just to give you sort of a flavor of the types of analyses we're doing and sort of to motivate some of the difficulties that we're going to encounter when I talk to you about sort of the context in which this is all happening. Okay. And so when we were first planning for these studies, you know, our, our group had expertise in, in correlates analyses for many years related to HIV vaccines, dengue vaccines, and so forth. Uh, but COVID is obviously a very unique situation. 
right? So from the very beginning, we knew that, you know, the, the work we were going to do was going to be heavy, heavily scrutinized. I and mean, if you remember in the summer of 2020, there was a big sort of hullabaloo and a big press for the companies to release their, their uh, clinical trial protocols, which to their, you know, to their credit, they did. Uh, but it was just giving us an idea at that time that, right, like the public is going to be very interested in these results. And in particular, when we're talking about developing an immune correlate, in other words, creating a shortcut for approving vaccines, well, that's going to be even more heavily scrutinized, right? The public's going to be interested in making sure that those that the evidence that that decision is based on is is robust and transparent. So we needed to be committed to, to doing this all in a very open way. Uh, you know, these are obviously very high impact science happening here. This is going to the FDA. We'll talk to WHO about it, to the EMA, right, and potentially influence global regulatory policy as it relates to COVID vaccines. So, you know, for anybody who's coded in this sort of high stakes environment, it's, it's quite stressful, right? It's quite stressful to, to be able to make sure that you're getting the analysis right. OK, so we'll talk about sort of how we try to mitigate that, the risk of incorrect uh, analyses. Uh, and then we knew that, that it wasn't just one clinical trial we were working with, right? The U.S. government funded five trials. So they, they did Moderna, Johnson & Johnson, Novavax, Sanofi, uh, and AstraZeneca. And we knew that, that each of these trials were generating their own correlates data. And so we had to sort of have an eye towards making sure that our code could be recycled for many trials so that we could have quick turnaround when, when these data started to arrive. Now, there were also a, a unique set of challenges that we were expecting, right? From the outset, we, we sort of knew that we're, there's going to be some complex statistical methodology involved here. I've shown sort of some, some, some of the basics involving Cox models, but, but our analysis plan went well beyond that. And these aren't methodologies where they're sort of readily available and robust software. These are methodologies that are really being developed custom for the COVID situation. So we needed to structure the analysis in such a way that we could get the statisticians who have the right expertise implementing different parts of the analysis. But then thinking about from like sort of a meta perspective, how do we bring in all of that together into a unified report is, is quite challenging. Uh, the second element of this is that some of the methodology we're that, we're, that we're implementing in this study is really difficult to reproduce. So in particular, we have many analyses that involve ensemble machine learning. That involves a layer of cross-validation. And so there's a lot of sort of randomness in these procedures that are involving machine learning, right? And so when we think about making sure all of this is reproducible, making sure that it holds water when it's scrutinized by regulatory bodies, that's that's quite a challenge. Of course, all this needed to happen in a regulatory compliant computing framework. So that sort of limits the tools that we have at our disposal for reproducible research. Uh, and all of this was, of course, happening under ex extreme time pressure. So working in COVID vaccines over the last year has been just an, an, insane, an insane experience because everything is already happening uh, too late. It's happening at warp speed, right? OK, and so the, the, the final challenge of all this, the first company, if you'll remember, to launch their vaccine. So Pfizer was first. Fine. They weren't involved with the U.S. government. The second after that was Moderna. And so we knew Moderna was kind of in the field first. They were the first ones who were going to have correlates data generated that we needed to analyze. Uh, but also privy to their agreement with the U.S. government, Moderna basically said, we're not going to give you our data until we have a BLA from the FDA, until we have full product approval. We're not going to give anybody direct access to our data. So they said, yes, we'll play ball with the government, but no, you can't access our data. Right. And so that's the challenge we were kind of faced with is we have this suite of, of fairly complex statistical methodology. We want to in, in, implement it in a, in a robust, reproducible, transparent way. Right. But we're not allowed to touch the data from Moderna. So it was quite a harrowing sort of experience. And it reminded me of this quote. I can't remember. I heard the, a COVID researcher describe this as how we're mounting our response to the COVID pandemic, saying we're not building the airplane while we're flying. We're sewing the parachute while falling. Uh, and at various points uh, throughout this process, I can absolutely relate to that quote. So just we'll, we'll touch on a few of the ways that we've tried to uh, do a good job being reproducible and open uh, and address some of the challenges we had in this using reproducible software tools. So first, we, we developed everything out in the open. So very early on, we published a SAP online. Uh, you can go and view it. You see it's gone through about 12 different versions. And I put this up here because it, you know, I, I, I contend that 15,000 views of a statistical analysis plan has got to at least be in the top 10 statistical analysis plans of all time. And so uh, I think our team can feel very proud of that, that, that 15,000 people have viewed our very, very boring 100-page long statistical analysis plan. Uh, moreover, we've been doing all our software development very openly on GitHub. You can go to our, our repo. It's linked here. Uh, and, and if you really want, right, we're very open about this. There's over 3,000 commits there. You can watch us fumble along this whole process of trying to implement this reproducible pipeline. 
Uh, and so we really are committed to, to developing this stuff out in the open. Uh, and that's that's fun and it's a little bit scary, right? But but I think it's what needed to happen. So one of the first things that, that I was tasked with doing is just thinking about an organization structure. So I really like this quote from Jenny Bryan, file organization and naming are powerful weapons against chaos. And I want to thank my team for being like very patient with me as I like harped and harped and harped on how we were going to organize this project to make it actually happen. And there's really nothing revolutionary here, but I do put it here because I do think organizing projects is, is very important, very much overlooked very often and, and very often not a part of our sort of curriculum. And we teach statisticians uh, about coding, but it's but it's very important. So if you'll remember, I said there's many different analysts involved that are implementing many, many different components of this that we eventually need to stitch back together at the end. So we wanted to make this sort of modular organization structure where sort of one analyst could be tasked with developing different elements of the of the project. So we would have a, a single developer working on a single element of the project. And their task was basically, you know, we're under time pressure here, right? So however you can, you need to write reproducible code that generates an R markdown report, right? Specifically pertaining to that portion of the analysis. And then on top of that, we sort of layer this meta structure that weaves all of those reports together into a final report. So we did that using, uh, using book down. So you know, there was some some tension here, right? Like between how strict we wanted to give the deadlines, you know, or how strict we wanted to be with with our deadlines versus how strict we wanted to be with our coding uh, our coding guide, right? How much structure do we want to enforce that people had to adhere to? So we kept it fairly loose. Uh, we used uh, GNU Make to try to you know structure dependencies between our files, and I think project organization actually gets you a pretty long way in terms of of generating helpful reproducible. Uh, research. So moving on to the next element of the, the analysis, which was code verification. And so this was a, a quite an undertaking is that all our high importance results uh, underwent double programming. So we had a, an, an original programmer who would write the, the analysis code, generate a specification document. An independent programmer would, based on the specification document, have to reproduce those results uh, and confirm that they got identical results. And we did this for sort of all the, the analyses that we deemed high risk, which was Quite, quite a lot of our, our analysis. Uh, and Ellis Hughes was really instrumental in getting this, this sort of verification process off the ground. Uh, I say this like, you know, there's a lot of clinical trial statisticians, people from pharma here, you know, who are like, yeah, you did double programming, so what? We do that all the time, right? But the level of complexity of the analyses that we were working on in this, I think has really made this very quite, quite challenging for us. So we're, we're needing to reproduce results that involve ensemble machine learning, that involve multiple layers of cross-validation, implementing many different types of machine learning methodology. So this was quite a challenge and quite an undertaking. Uh, but, but in the end, we were able to, to actually pull this off. So that was pretty good. OK, so to prepare for the Moderna analysis, uh, right? We, we needed to figure out how to run our code on their servers, basically. So we, what, our approach for that was to generate practice data sets that we use for local development. And we gave detailed specs to Moderna to try to align the data formatting and definitions and so forth. Uh, with the data that we were practicing on. So we use the ROM package to do our package version control. And if you haven't messed with that package at all, I can't recommend it enough. A really beautiful framework for doing package control. Uh, the final thing we did was we had a continuous integration service set up on Travis, Travis CI, another great uh, tool if you're not familiar. So there we were able to basically configure a compute environment that like looked like Moderna's compute environment. Right. And every time we checked code into GitHub, it would trigger an automatic build of our reports on our practice data, which could be hosted publicly. And then those compiled reports would be pushed back to GitHub so we could develop in that way. And so here's me being very optimistic, writing an email to Moderna in early 2021, where I was like, don't worry about any of this. It's going to all be taken care of. You'll just go to your console, type make, right? drop the data set in, type make, and everything's going to build automatically. Here's me like four months later saying that this was like a harrowing experience, trying to debug code over, over WebEx. So I would say it took some effort, but in the end, we finally did get there with great patience from the Moderna statistician. Uh, we finally got the report to compile over a thousand pages uh, in total. Uh, a preprint's now available, the scientific results on MedArchive, and, and hopefully that'll get through it at Science pretty soon as well. So looking forward, and I, I know I'm at time here, so looking forward, we're thinking about how to generalize this to adapt to multiple clinical trials. So uh, we are currently working on an analysis of an HIV vaccine trial before we'll turn back to COVID, where we're working on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, all those other U.S. government-funded trials as well. 
So I'll leave with just a couple of lessons learned. Uh, for me, the, the lessons learned were that actually standardizing the computing architecture is not the hard part, right? We can do package control. You know, we can we can use cloud computing technologies to get in the same compute architecture, right? It's more the human elements that are challenging in this process: so standardizing data, formatting, processing, anticipating missing values. Those are the things that really bogged us down in this whole effort. So the solution for me is to learn to code a bit more def defensively, to encourage people to, to write code that's robust to missing values, that does a lot of sanity checks uh, and, and so forth. So, so thinking about you know, expecting the unexpected. Uh, continuous integration was the best decision I ever made as somebody who was managing code for this project, having you know, real-time feedback about whether people's code was compiling as expected took a lot off my plate. So really, really a worthwhile endeavor. And then finally, you know, there's always this difficult tension when you're operating very fast at warp speed, right? If you will, between needing to get key scientific results, right? While writing code that's quality enough to generalize for the next set of, of trials that you're gonna analyze. And I don't know if we've sort of struck the right balance of that or not, but it's been a learning experience for all of us. Okay, so I think I've gone a, a minute or two over, but I'm happy to stick around in the chat if there's any more questions, follow-ups, and then I'll just finish by saying, uh, go Braves.